service has been undertaken to look at how works and expenditure <coughs> can be spent more rapidly. As, cab as cabinet member, I am due to make a decision under my delegated authority for some changes to the service, including streamlining existing processes, use of contractors to speed up specific works being undertaken, and discretionary budgets to target those vulnerable households who at present cannot proceed with the DFG due to the government placing a statutory cap on DFG grants awarded. Additional staff have also been put in place to meet the demands on the service and this will be continued to be reviewed. I am pleased to say that the Adaptations, Adaptations Programme supports early intervention and prevention solutions which in turn support both the health and care agenda and assists in many aspects of reducing hospital admissions and readmissions, examples, injuries due to falls in people aged 65 and older. In summary, I hope that this demonstrates the good work which is being done on adaptations overall in supporting vulnerable households and expenditure alone is not the only measure of performance that should be considered. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hayes. Um, now, I'm going to ask the same. Have you responded to your questions? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go to Councillor Stewart questioning them now. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Madam Mayor. Uh, uh, in response to Councillor Cleary's uh, question, uh, when, when the decision was made around the North Bank, I looked at the the objections of the North South Central campaign. Uh, and the special advice I received was that uh, there was no allowance for within the uh, Road Traffic Act to uh, not allow the open ways as the same advice went across the side road. Uh, at the Actor Travel Forum uh, last week, it was, you know, we discussed it with the uh, Minister of the 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 Minister uh, we need uh, the NCC's demands. Uh, Councillor Powell, uh, Griffins, you, you may remember 2015 was a budget option to, uh, to, to remove uh, Griffins that have been provided by uh, the reforms, uh, on one less uh, no constituent committees or all the forms of funding that we uh, identified to, to be filled. We weren't filled last year, uh, however, and obviously they've been removed uh, for this year. Uh, if members you know, can identify the source of funds or you know, volunteers to you know, fill those ribbons, if you get in contact with me, I'll see what we can do to, to get them in the state. But there's no, there's no money from the councils to the coffers to fill those ribbons, unfortunately. Uh, thanks to Councillor Kenny for the question. Uh, I, think, I think this is excellent news for the rest of this world. Uh, I think by putting the service delivery, uh, what's maximised the number of pounds. Yeah, the four months we will end up with a highway service that is in the direct control of the council that will be more agile on the tunes, the tune with its concerns and needs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Angela, Angela Davis. Okay, um, the first answer is to Councillor Blake Blue's question. He was asking me about the number of huge developers and about the due diligence in relation to the Royal Growth Company. Um, the competitive dialogue is ongoing at the moment, so this is still a live procurement exercise. So I'm unable to go into exact detail about the number of developers at this time. We expect to be in a position to bring forward the preferred deal very early in 2018. And I can confirm that appropriate and robust due diligence will be completed. Um, the second question was from our councillor Kathy Hodson. Um, Kathy, you were asking me what is the total cost of the shared intelligence and BWB work. Um, I'll provide you with a written answer because I want to give you the exact figures. Um, we haven't commissioned a third report at this moment in time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jeanette Williamson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Okay, so I'll start with Chris Lately, who asked the question of Matt, because that came back to me. Um, also, I'm going to say well done for asking me something that's actually in the report. 
Um, you asked about opposition and engagement in the budget setting process and about my um, meeting with scrutiny. Well, as you know, cabinet members don't influence scrutiny. We all read budget workshops and scrutiny committees to complete. I'm sure that they'll be really productive with regards to a more extensive opposition engagement ticket. You know, all views are welcome. I personally haven't had any emails or contact from anybody outside of my own group regarding budget proposals. There's no such thing as a bad idea, unless it's really bad, obviously. And that's a bad idea, but, you know, metaphorically speaking, my door is always open, and I would welcome engagement. We want, we want to make a collaborative approach, so feel free to email. Um, Councillor Burgess Joyce, you asked about something that's not very important, which is the golf resort. Um, all I'll say on this is that any loan made by the council would be an opportunity for us to bring some income back to us with regards to interest rates, etc. Obviously, they don't have those to hand. Any loan made, of course, will only be done after due diligence is completed. Les Bowers, you quoted some figures around the underspend of various coastal protection and potholes. Obviously, that's not really important. I have got those figures to hand, but I will provide a written response to that one. Okay. Uh, Kathy, hate to, to, to say the same thing here, but you, you talked about a loan bar please and about mantling the council, but again that's not in my report so I don't have those figures to hand, but I'm more than happy to make some inquiries on that. And just while we're on the subject of loans, I mean it is a way for local authorities to continue to work to generate income every council does it. In fact I did answer some questions recently around two specific investments into the local councils. They were very short term investments, 183 days I think both of them were, but they brought in 16,000 pounds to us. I'm sure we can all bring an example forward of what that 16,000 pounds will have brought or contributed to us well. So they're just a common practice ourselves in um, Adam, you asked about me meeting with the trade unions. Okay, it's um, I, I don't meet the trade unions, that's for the leadership to do that. Obviously the TUs are involved in every set of budget setting process, but that's not, not a role that I personally get involved in. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Matt. <laughs> I didn't answer your question about consultation. That's okay. So this originally came from Chris, but handily it's come over to me. Just bear with me out of time to the response to this. About this whole the whole process of how we deal with the bubble really, because I think it's, uh, it's it's frustrating all around, isn't it? You know, not not being able to give responses, not being able to ask questions really. But we are constrained by time on it. But there must be a better way. So um, I will ask officers to have a look at this now uh, within the constitution uh, during the uh, during the Christmas recess, so that when we come back to our first meeting. Uh, in the new year, we can uh, try and find a way to, to make sure that we really give this the airing that, uh, that it deserves. Because clearly, we want you know people want to be held to account, but at the same time, we are constrained by time. Okay, so thank you all very much. Madam Mayor, can I just say the questions are going to be answered by cabinet members. By email. Oh, yes, I'm sure as, as it's yeah, as case, as can we ensure that cabinet members do respond because my response last time came from the director, not the cabinet member. So perhaps we should incorporate 30 minutes of office time. Okay, can, can we ensure that those, those uh, cabinet members and scrutiny chairs who haven't had an opportunity to respond this evening respond directly to all members of the council with their reply? Thank you. Okay, I'm moving on now to item seven, which is members' questions, and I have three. Uh, noti I've been notified of three questions. Councillor Stuart Kelly to Councillor Phil Brightmore, Councillor Phil Gilchrist to Councillor Phil Davis, and Councillor David Burgess Joyce to Councillor Phil Davis. So I'm going to start with Councillor Kelly. Your question to Councillor Brightmore. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, the question to Phil Brightmore, of which I've, I've given notice. On one of the 
23rd of July, there were significant flooding incidents reported to me throughout Oxford and the later on Saturday uh, areas of Pentley uh, were also uh, affected and uh, flooded indeed caused severe damage to residential property. Uh, <coughs> the incident was so extreme that it triggered a requirement for a Section 19 investigation under the Flood and Water Management Act of 2010. Now we have five months after those events, but the residents affected still haven't been able to see the outcome and the outcome of those investigations. Can I ask the item the cabinet member to use his influence to ensure that this long overdue report is published before Christmas? Will he agree to meet with ward members in the areas affected to discuss the specific contents and recommendations of the report? And will he also agree to look at measures that can be taken to prevent the damage to property that's being caused by flooding. And the mayor, as climate change becomes a reality, these flooding events <coughs> will become more common, and the administration really needs to get to grip to tackle issues such as the clearing or the lack of clearing of any gullies or culverts, the problems that are caused by the raised raising of road surfaces with respect to curbs following highway maintenance, and any other engineering solutions that can be uh, used to alleviate the death most to rural residents in my flooding incidents. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. A few questions, Stuart. The investigation into the significant flood event from the 23rd of July 2017 has identified that 35 properties have been flooded internally and 39 externally. And whilst the flooding mechanism for many of these is straightforward to identify, some properties were flooded by surface water and not private land. Discussions and investigations with these organisations have taken some time to complete, but the last site visit was undertaken towards the end of last week. Following the final site visit, the draft Section 19 investigation report is nearing completion. The draft report will be shared with all risk management authorities referenced prior to finalising the publication. The draft report will be finalised prior to Christmas, however, reasonable time will need to be given for the risk management authorities of the United Utilities, Welsh Waters, Royal Council Highway Authority and the Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service to comment. This is why it's taken so long to do, it's not through lack of care. It's apparent from the information collected for the investigation that the flooding was caused by severe and external rainfall of very short intensity. Analysis shows the chance of this type of rainfall occurring in any one year to be 0.125%. This is way in excess of the design standards for drainage assets, which is 5%. As a consequence, drainage systems are exceeded and water flowed into properties. There's loads of recommendations that have been made in response to a rare event like this, of the one on the 23rd of July in order to prevent reoccurrence of drainage flood system causes, other than to encourage property owners to make their property more resilient to flooding. And this has already been action through a targeted letter on August this year. Residents at 176 properties were contacted directly with information signposting them to how they can prepare for future flooding by making their property more resilient. A further mail shall be out, and also I've asked for more information to be cascaded through the constituency forums and other local networks. A number of site visits also took place in the Miami War, during the Memorial War II, and where it was possible for the council to amend and fix problems, that was done. Where highway debris has been identified as a factor in the flooding, a recommendation would be given to a review of frequency of sweeping and gully cleansing. However, Additional highway gullies would not serve to alleviate the flooding as the design capacity of assets was exceeded. It is likely that additional gullies would make the flooding situation worse with water and sewage to surcharging from the sewer. Stuart, of course, I will come with you and your colleagues. And thank you, Thank you. And now a question from Councillor Phil Gilchrist, Council of Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. At its budget meeting on the 3rd of February 2017, the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority allocated Wirral £272,000 out of the Pothole Action Fund provided by the Family Transport. How much of this money has actually been spent on tackling Wirral's potholes today? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you to Councillor Gilchrist for uh, notice of this question. 
The answer to which is as follows. The, the pothole fund allocation to rural that you mentioned was approved following the meeting of the, uh, the Liverpool City Region on the 3rd of February this year. Uh, as it says, the allocation for rural, rural was £272,000. The fund allocation has a number of conditions set by the Department of Transport which require the money to be spent to complement existing maintenance funding and the report must be published on the Council website by the end of March 2018 detailing the activities undertaken. So the fund was, was uh, planned to be allocated to three main work areas. Surface dressing £40,000, micro asphalt £132,000 and patching £100,000. The micro uh, asphalt work was completed during the summer on the surface dressing. The patching is being undertaken in all wards throughout the current financial year. In terms of current spending, the surface dressing and micro asphalt work has been completed with the planned budget allocated, but final accounts have not yet been uh, submitted, so confirmation of payments cannot yet be made. Current spending of patching is £63,919. Uh, the value of patching work issued but not yet completed or invoiced is approximately £10,000. The anticipated total current spend is currently £235,919. In terms of completing the uh, programme, there is approximately some £26,000 of work still to be issued which will be undertaken during the last quarter of this financial year. Should there be any funds available from the surface dressing or micro-asphalt work, there are plans to undertake large patching in high-stress junctions. And finally, Madam Mayor, in accordance with the Department of Transport requirements, lists of all the roads and details of the works that I've um, uh, mentioned will be published on the Council website before the 31st of March 2018. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Burgess Joyce, question to Councillor Hilton. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, the question is Could the Leader of the Council outline his plans completed or, or currently in train to tackle the anomaly of a specialist transport provider losing his license via the lawfully constituted licensing panel, yet given new contracts less than a few days later by Council officers? The operator is retained to transport children with special needs on behalf of the council, yet when the panel found that drivers had no DBS or medical checks, one with a significant history of heart trouble, were being used, they declined renewal of the licence. Finding the same operator being offered further contracts from council officers before the appeal had been heard at court, which it subsequently lost, appears to jeopardise the safety of some of Riddle's most vulnerable children. Now, subsequent to that, there was a cross-party meeting graciously attended by the League of Council. And it is fair to say that we have some very interesting comments to make. And I think in fairness to Phil, he was as shocked as the rest of us. But what I don't know is where we are up to with regards to how we are dealing with such a matter where one part of the Council is rightly refusing a licence and the other part of the Council is then giving contracts. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, and uh, again, can I thank, um, thank David for advance notice of this issue, and as he said, I, I treat this with the utmost seriousness, and as soon as I heard about it, I did uh, call a meeting of cross-party meetings, which David attended, and other colleagues from other groups um, uh, on, who sat, sit on the licensing committee to, to discuss this. Um, issue and we met on the, the 16th of November to specifically understand the scale and the risk of the situation that David had outlined and we had off relevant appropriate officers in attendance including the Chief Executive. I, I want to make it clear Madam Mayor that I do place the safety and well-being of the children of this at the very top of my priority list and in situations of fear where safety is being jeopardised I will request immediate action to address those risks. Uh, in order to ensure the safety of all our service users, I've requested that lead officers work together to ensure that there is a single set of robust licensing requirements for all the drivers and escorts transporting children with special educational needs and disabilities and our vulnerable adults on council contracts. 
And that stops us to ensure that the new contracts, which will be negotiated and agreed uh, next year, uh, and any further subsequent contracts have within their terms and conditions the right for the council to, dis to suspend or terminate should a breach of licensing or DBS requirements be proven. Office officers have, have also provided reassurance to myself and members of the licensing panel that they will also review the procurement evaluation criteria of all new contracts to ensure that they are suitably robust. With regard, Madam Mayor, with regard to existing licenses, we will not hesitate to invoke the clauses in the contract which state that breaches such as using drivers with no DBS checks or without the correct license can be treated as significant breaches and therefore will lead to that contract being terminated. I think there should be no doubt uh, about that. And, and finally, um, can I reassure uh, that David Burgess Joyce and the other colleagues who I met, I am in the process of reconvening that cross-party group um, to report back in more detail on, on how we've addressed all of these issues. And um, you know, obviously I look forward to your attendance and other members' attendance because it's absolutely essential we, we get this issue right. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. So that brings us to the end of this question. So moving on to item eight, matter prepared for overview scrutiny committees or other council committees. Councillors, we now turn to item eight on pages 65 to 76 of the agenda, which includes recommendations from the environment overview and scrutiny committee meeting of the 30th of November the Council meeting of the 16th of October and the Standards and Constitutional Oversight Committee of the 29th of June and the 31st of October. Firstly then, item A on page 65 of the main agenda. 8A, Notice of Motion. T tougher action on fly tipping. tipping. I now invite Council Paul Stewart, Chair of the Environment Committee, to move the recommendation as contained in page 2 of your agenda supplement. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Thank you. All those in favour of the recommendation in respect of agenda item 8A, please clearly indicate. One abstention. That's carried with one abstention. <coughs> okay, item 8B, notice of motion making more time for pedestrians. I invite Councillor Mike Sullivan, Chair of the Business Overview and Scrutiny Committee, to move the recommendation as set out on page 4 of your agenda supplement. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So moved. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Davis. All those in favour of the recommendation in respect of agenda item 8B, please clearly indicate. Unanimously carried with one abstention. Uh, uh, agenda item 8C, notice of motion, we're all well made. I invite Councillor Mike Sullivan to the Business Overview and Scrutiny Committee to move the recommendation as set out on page 6 of your agenda supplement. Once again, thank you, Madam Mayor, so moved. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Second. Thank you, Davis, thank you. All those in favour of the recommendation in respect of agenda item 8C, please show. Clearly carried with one extension. <coughs> Moving on to agenda item 8D, Standards and Constitutional Oversight Committee of the 29th of June. I invite Councillor Maureen McLaughlin, Chair of the Standards and Constitutional Oversight Committee, to move the recommendation as set out on pages 65 to 87, 67 sorry, of your agenda papers in the respect of minute 10. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. So, we're going to give your Commission on a short statement in relation to the minutes of the meeting on the 31st of the 10th. Okay. Um, yeah, I was going to say, let's get it seconded first. And um, then we want to make a statement before we move to the vote. Yes, okay. um, Councillors, I recognise that this is an unusual action I'm taking tonight, uh, but I'm doing it as Chair of the Council Standards and Constitutional Oversight Committee at the request of the committee members and in response to an extraordinary demonstration of disrespect to both members of the public and to the authority of this council by an elected member of this council, Councillor Louise Rich Jones. In June of this year, Councillor Louise Jones was the subject of a standards hearing where she was found to have uh, used her position as a councillor to damage the reputation and the lives of members of the public and in doing so had shown disrespect to them and was in breach of the council code of conduct. 
one of the sanctions imposed was, was that she be required to make a full written apology to those people she had harmed. In October, the full committee heard that she failed to comply with any part of the sanctions imposed, that she found to have continued the activity which led to the findings of a breach in the first instance, and she failed to cooperate in an open way with the Council Commission independent investigation, and therefore had further breached the code of conduct. She was given a further 14 days to make the apology, and to the best of my knowledge, she has not yet done that. She was also required to come to full council to repeat it to her fellow elected members. This was an indication of the anger and the frustration felt by the committee members at her action, but also at our lack of ability to impose meaningful sanctions as a council when the behaviour of an elected member falls so far below that expected by the people who elect us to uphold the known principles of honesty, integrity, selflessness and leadership. This is an opportunity now for Councillor Rees Jones to make some amends for her behaviour so far and to demonstrate the respect for this council that she has so far failed to do, and I hope that she will take it. Thank you. 